Let me ask you to stand and we'll just have a quick prayer together as we get into Revelation chapter 21. There's a story about a great Puritan leader, John Owen, and the way this was described, that he was was on his deathbed, he was about to pass, and his secretary was writing a note to one of his friends for him in his name, and, and 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 it read like this, I'm still in the land of the living, and he said, no, 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 change it, say that I'm still in the land of the dying, and I'm going to the land of the living. Because whether we like it or not, we live in the land of the dying in so many different ways. But thank God we're going to the land of the living, and Revelation chapter 21 is all about that land, a land called heaven. Amen? Amen? So Lord, thank you for that hope and that promise of the land of the living. May we just hear your voice through your word today and embrace it and receive it and, and Lord, be strengthened, encouraged, and challenged by it. So speak to us today. Give us ears to hear and hearts to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Grab a seat if you would. Someone once said that the church is a hospital, a spiritual hospital where people can be healed and made whole. And I've made this comment about it, that it can't be so clean and antiseptic that you're not afraid to let people in who are messy. It can't be a hospital where, oh, we we can't do surgery because we don't want to get blood on the table. But at the same time, it can't be so messy where people begin to infect one another. But it's a hospital. Some would say, no, the, the church is a school where we study to show ourselves approved unto God. Uh, there's, a, there's a passage, 2 Timothy, I believe, to study, and this is from uh, King James, so it's study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's a hospital. No, it's a school. And some say, no, it's a It's a gymnasium where we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We have that verse in Philippians, I think, that speaks of that. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. So so we've got a hospital. No, it's a school. No, it's a gym. And then maybe one of the analogies, perhaps, most importantly, someone said, no, it's supposed to be a travel agency. <laughs> Booking people on that final eternal excursion to heaven. So I don't know if you've signed up yet or not, but I hope you have. Chapter 21 certainly could be seen as part of that travel brochure as it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. And, and John begins, if you have the scripture there, with, with these words in, in verse 21, now, and then here are his words, I saw. John sees. He's been seeing all through this book, and, and as he's there captured and sort of exiled on the Isle of Patmos, he, he, he sees. And he sees some amazing things. We've been watching all the different things that John has encountered and that he has seen as he's been given this amazing revelation. And here in this chapter, he describes quite a few things that he saw. He says, I saw a new heaven. I saw a new earth. I saw a new Jerusalem. I saw a new world order. I saw a new temple, but it's not really a temple. I, I, I saw light. I saw paradise. And we have here in this chapter a detailed account of what heaven will be like. There in 
the first few verses, I saw a new heaven, a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They'll be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So following the great white throne judgment in chapter 20, John sees a whole new creation. It, it, it's like in Genesis 1, where, where we have that very first statement in Scripture where it talks about, you know, God creates and, and that, that very first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and, he, and at the end of time, he does it again, a new heaven, a new earth. I, I like how one writer put it. He says, human history began in a garden and ends in a city that's like a garden, a paradise. You get the best of both worlds. Not only do you get this amazing city, but you get a, get a garden-like atmosphere. The Apostle Peter describes what occurs like this in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it are burned up. It's just this whole new heaven and new earth. And there's quite a few statements in this opening verse that, that reveal uh, God's purpose for a new heaven and a new earth. One is the, the new Jerusalem. The city that, that John describes becomes the center of the world. He describes a, a new world order, a new heaven. And I, I'm sure it means, you know, as, if I, as I've studied through Revelation, I'll be honest with you, uh, this is a tough book. You, you read it and you go, well, what's, what's literal? What's symbolic? And, and you grapple with this thing. And, and I'm not sure it means that the old heaven and the old earth are, are done away with completely, as I've read through all these different commentaries. So what does this mean? Does it mean now that the, the earth is completely gone and a brand new one, that heaven is completely changed? And the wording here in the Greek and in the Hebrew, as you look at the different writers, it's very difficult to interpret. But, but we do know that this heaven and this earth is changed. And one of the ways it is changed that seems predominant, that kind of makes its way to the surface as you read through it, is that it's cleansed. It's different. It's changed. It's kind of like when you or I come to Christ, you're still the same person. We still recognize you, but you're different. You're changed. You're, you're cleansed. You're, you're forgiven, and the earth will be new. It'll be a new heaven, a new earth. The earth and heavens are both governed by a certain, and when I speak of heavens, we, we, we're talking about the, the, you know, the galaxies and the, the planets, a new heaven and a new earth, and, and the both of those are governed by uh, certain laws of nature. One of those is, I'm sure you're aware of, is the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, that things are losing energy, that they're decaying, that they're growing cold, that they're aging. Well, this is reversed in the new earth, in the new heaven. So there's new energy, there's new stability, there's new beauty, there's new productivity, no more aging. And, and it says something interesting there in verse 1. I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And as a surfer, when I read that, no more sea, <laughs> I kind of go, bummer, dude. <laughs> like, what? No more sea? 
And, and as you read that and think about it, you know, we have water everywhere on the earth. Like three-fourths of the earth is covered with water. And this says there's, there's no more sea. And, and I think about that, and I, I say, well, maybe what it means, and I don't know if this is true or not, maybe this is just, you know, a, a hope that, you know, most of the water on the face of the earth is salt water. And it's a great antiseptic to cleanse the oceans. They, the, the oceans purge and preserve. It deals with pollution and cleanses the planet in so many ways. So I think maybe, perhaps, there'll be bodies of water, but it may just be fresh water. No need to cleanse anymore. The earth has been cleansed. It's been purified. You know, no need for salt to, to be an antiseptic in, in the world, and, and, and there'll be no smog. So if, if it all turns to fresh and clean and clear water, you could surf all day and then drink the water. How cool is that? I'd go for that. But we'll leave it in his hands, right? Although we don't have a choice. New Jerusalem, seen as a bride, it says. Coming down out of heaven, in verse 2, adorned for her husband. Now, I would, I would surmise that most of us have either been in or been to a wedding. And the focal point of every wedding is when everyone rises and the bride comes down the aisle. She's the star of the show, beautifully dressed and, and, and coming to meet her husband. And the imagery here, the message is that this city, this, this uh, new Jerusalem, will be a thing of beauty, a, a thing of expectation, a thing of intimacy. And, and the city speaks of community and relationship. There, there's this... There's this Time coming when this new heaven, this new earth, this, this new community with, with great energy, with great intimacy, with great beauty, and great closeness with the Lord, and yet also with one another. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Now we are children of God, and it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. A new heaven, a new earth, a new city, a, a cleansing, uh, and, and, and a new us. You know, when, when, when I look in the mirror now, it's not a new me. In fact, it's an older me. And it seems like it's, it's an older me more every day. And there's this thing that we're all looking forward to, to see him and then to be like him, to, 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 to be cleansed and to be new, this new heaven, this new earth. And, and, and it also says that this will be a dwelling place for God. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle, verse 3, of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So you've got this, this wonderful new dwelling place with God, a place where God lives with his people. Emmanuel is completely fulfilled, God with us to its fullness. And then it goes on to describe some of the things that won't be there. And someone has said it like this as you look at verse 4, that it'll be a place of no more, a place of no more, no more death, no more sorrow, no more separation, no more pain, no more tears, no more evil, no more surgeries, no more funerals, no more Highway 98 road construction. No more social media. Thank you, Lord Jesus. No more shooters. No more hurricanes. No more 
classified documents being found in every house. It, it's so different. It, it, it's so amazing, so powerful. It, it, it's hard to imagine. I think John felt that way as all of this is coming at him in this, this revelation, this vision he's having on this island. All this stuff is coming at him at, at such a quick, amazing, like he's trying to write it, trying to figure out what it is. And so it says, as he is taking in these first four verses, it says, Then he who sat on the throne, as John's taking all this in, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said, It is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And when John is trying to probably take all this in, like, like sometimes we do as we're reading this and trying to make sense of it, he says, look, it's done. It's real. I'm the beginning and the end. Everything coming from me, John. And, and now he, he's, he's, he's letting him know. He's giving him assurance. It's kind of like, uh, this is how it's going to be. I'm the one in charge. It's like in... Uh, John chapter 19, after, after there's darkness, after there's pain, after there's humiliation, after separation, Jesus cried out, it is done. It's finished. It's over. And complete redemption. Sacrifice is ended. And nothing left incomplete. All are safe in God's new heaven. This, this is what uh, John is seeing. This is what John is seeing. He says, he's going to dwell with my people. It's going to be a new city. going to be a new heaven. And then he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. It's finished. I'm bringing it to an end. And now the new Jerusalem described as a home for all those who have been redeemed by Christ. And he says this. I love this part about it as, he, as, he, as he's bringing this to an end. There in chapter 6, claiming who he is, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He says, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirst and he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he or she shall be my son my my daughter the life is given to who well those who thirst those who overcome because nothing on earth really satisfies the thirst other than him nothing Nothing on earth, not, not riches, not, not travel, not fun, not fame, not beauty, not freedom. And, and people who are trying to find that sense of satisfaction in life, well, they always want more. The next trip, the, the next deal, the next relationship, whatever it might be. But here we have a promise from God in Scripture that he promises to satisfy that thirst for all those who will come, for all those who will drink. You know, I remember when, when I was 16 years old, I thought I was, I was so smart. Can you imagine being 16 and thinking you're so smart? <laughs> so I was so smart that I dropped out of high school. And, and I had an opportunity. I was involved in the surf culture and this, this, this man decided that me and two of my best friends, he would pay for us to come up to this place in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. He was going to let us live in his surf shop. He was going to pay us to work there and take us surfing and pay for us to go to contests. And I mean, when you're 16 years old and you're living in a surf shop and you can go surfing anytime you want to and he'll take you to contests, you're like, this is heaven. And you think, you're, you think you have the greatest life in the world. And then I turned 17. My older brother's becoming a no, well-known surfer, and, and so we travel together to San Diego. We're living in a place right on the beach. We have the whole summer, and all we're doing is hanging out and surfing in San Diego in 1970. I mean, come on. And then I'm 18. And we were surfing for this company called Greg Knoll Surfboards. And, and my brother and I get to go with this couple from San Diego. And we drive all the way from Miami to Maine. 
repping surfboards, showing films, living in surf shops, you know, just having fun, no responsibilities. But as we did it, and as we traveled, and as we did all these things, there was always kind of this sense of, so this is it? There's always inside of me also something of a loneliness for some reason, something missing, not feeling just right or satisfied. And, and God promises to satisfy that thirst. People who, who want more, uh, they may not know it, but people who are just always looking for that next high or that next experience, whatever it is, what they really need is the Lord Jesus Christ who brings a sense of, like, oh, I can rest. I, I, there's a contentment there. They, they can drink, as it's talking right here, of the water of life. And they can be called, as they're described here, as overcomers, who, who overcome the world, and, and they inherit all that God offers and all that he's created. Verse 7 says this, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, my daughter. Salvation, changed by God's grace and his children forever. This is amazing promise. This is an amazing description of, of the new heaven, the new earth, and, and, and it all speaks of this intimacy, this relationship, this satisfaction that comes through this amazing relationship with God and Jesus Christ and going to a place that he's prepared for us. And then it gives this description. It's a description of those who are not a part of this community, in verse 8, it says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the, the, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, all the liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, I don't believe God desires or wants to condemn in fact, in John chapter 3, where Jesus is explaining to that religious Pharisee, Nicodemus, who he is and why he's come, he said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he doesn't take pleasure in condemning. But people will judge themselves by refusing and then living in this fashion that is mentioned here in verse 8. He says, first, there's cowards. Those who are fearful and afraid to make a stand for the truth and Jesus Christ. Choose to stay in the old life. Choose to stay in the old world. Afraid, well, what will people say? Or, 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 or I don't want to let go of this. I have to have this in my life. Or unwilling to leave those things that God says you must leave. He speaks of the unbelieving, those perhaps who know it's true but refuse all the evidence, those who deliberately turn their backs on the truth, hearts convicted but unwilling to admit their need. Oh, I don't need God. So you've got the You've got the cowardly, you've got the unbelieving, and then it says the abominable, which is a word that could be translated vile or filthy or foul, and it begins to describe some of the deeds that, that comes from those who are abominable, filled with those things that are unclean. And it flows out of their life in attitude, and it flows out of their life in action. And it, it describes them as murderers, as those who are sexually immoral, as, as sorcerers, would be those who are involved in drugs, idolaters, and all liars will have their place in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So he, in this first section, describes those who thirst and whose thirsts are fulfilled and those who will not receive. And then he goes on to describe this new Jerusalem. 
In verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had seen the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Once again, you say, is this literal or is this symbolic? Well, well, Revelation is a difficult book to interpret. It's full of literal and symbolic. It's kind of like, this cross behind me, if you've ever noticed it, made out of tile, that's a real cross. You can see it. You can touch it. But it's also symbolic. It's symbolic of the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's both symbolic and real at the same time. It's both. And there will be, I think, a visible city of incredible brilliance and in God's glory that's described here. It's above and within the earth's atmosphere. It will contain relationships and activities among those who are living there, and it will be stable, it will be symmetric, it will be filled with light and life and ministry. And the words are literal, and yet some of it's very symbolic. High walls speak of separation and security. Inside, God dwelling with his people, his very own, made in his image, redeemed and restored. Gates, where you, you enter in and, and, and you enter out. Like in John chapter 10, where Jesus said, you know, I'm the door, and, and, and you come in and out. The gates are named for the tribes of Israel. So what's that about? Well, I think it's a constant reminder as you see those gates and the tribes mentioned, that salvation came out of Israel, was prophesied, and that God kept his word. Amen. It's the fulfillment of all that he promised, the line of David and all that God had done through the people of Israel. Truth reflected through the ages of his faithfulness. And as you pass by those gates, you say, wow, from the very beginning, God made this promise. And he gives access the foundations speak of stability and permanence, named for the 12 apostles. Of course, Judas replaced, you know, in Acts chapter 1 by Matthias. And these foundations established by the apostles speak of the church as they planted and oversaw and instructed the, the truth of the New Testament, its doctrine, its practice. And, and we see and understand Scripture best as we see the two old and new come together, fulfilling prophecy and reaching forward into the future, and, and, and the best we can as we see the wonder and the beauty of the church. Some things pass away and some things don't. You know, it's a glimpse of what is to come. And, and we're given measurements in here. It says in verse... 15, and he who walked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls, and the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as a great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length and breadth and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel." When God measures something, listen, when God measures something, it's a sign of ownership. It's like if you bought a piece of property, you want it surveyed, you want it measured, you, you know, say, okay, this is what I own. And God is measuring. 
And the number 12 is used, 12,000 furlongs and 144 cubits, 12 by 12 wide. It's, it's just as tall as it is long and just as wide as it is tall. It's, it's perfect in symmetry. And the number 12 in Scripture is actually the number of government, 12 apostles, 12 foundation in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I think I might have put this up there, maybe. Yeah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. He'll be the one ruling and reigning in this new city. It's a picture of wholeness, of perfection. Nothing awkward, nothing out of balance. Everyone wants wholeness. Everyone wants fulfillment and balance, and we, we find it in the leadership and in his rule, and, and all the materials are listed. This is an amazing passage of Scripture. The construction of its wall was jasper. The city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones like jasper and sapphire. You pronounce the next one. The fourth emerald the fifth sardinux, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopas, the eleventh jacob, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, and each individual gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. So we have all these materials listed transparent gold, all kinds of colors. You've got these great jewels, gates made of a single pearl. Each, each gate is a, is a gigantic pearl, which gives me great hope because there must be oceans or seas <laughs> because pearls come from oysters. So these are some humongous oysters and, and pearls speak of beauty, but they also speak of pain, right? Because an oyster, as you know, a, a pearl is formed when a tiny grain of sand or something gets inside of an oyster. In order to relieve itself from that, the oyster, as it's irritated and comfortable, it covers the irritant with some kind of soft, lustrous substance that... that hardens into a beautiful, glowing pearl. That's how a pearl's formed. And, and it, it's, a, it's an interesting picture. It, it, uh, if you would allow, allow this analogy, it's kind of like it describes the redeem come from the pain of redemption, that which brings him pain and that which causes suffering, the hurt and the anguish. Of the cross. It's a story of the pearl of great price, where, where the Lord, as you know, gives that parable in Matthew. And he says, A kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking a beautiful pearl, who, when he had found one, a pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. And I think it's a picture of you and I. We're the pearl of great price that he's purchased. And it caused him much pain, much suffering. And Jesus gave everything he had to buy you and I. You are the pearl of great price. And God is an amazing God to do this for you and I. And the next is this transcendent light in verse 22. As we're coming to the end of this passage in Revelation chapter 21. And I saw no temple in it, speaking of this new Jerusalem, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. It has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminates it. The Lamb is the light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor to it. The gates shall not be shut at all by day. There'll be no night there. There'll be glory and honor of the nations into it. They shall bring it. But there shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those whose name are written in the Lamb's 
book of life. There's no temple. He's our temple. There's no need for a sacred place anymore because here's the deal. He is our sacred place. In him we live and move and have our being. He's our light. He's our dwelling place. He's our Savior. No night, no darkness, continually lit by God's presence and God's glory. All honor or greatness that anyone perhaps would have in any way on earth is brought and laid at his feet. Nothing is allowed that will defile. And it closes with that powerful verse that, you know, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life will be there. See, I, I believe there's two books. When you're born physically, your name is recorded. And then when you're born again, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And so the question obviously is, do you know your name is written there? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Do you know you're going to heaven? You may have a driver's license and you know you, your name's written there. Maybe you've been pulled over recently and you're, oh yeah, I got my registration, here's my name, here's my driver's license. Or, or, or you, maybe you've got a mortgage on your house, your name's written on there. Maybe you have a passport where you travel outside the country and you open it up and there's your name or you've got an insurance card or a marriage license or a debit card. Some of you, I'm looking out here, you've got a Medicare card. <laughs> but here, here's the question. Do you have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's the card you want. Have you believed and have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know you're going to live forever? You know, I, I, I was reminded of this. Um, I, I walked into the band room this morning, and I said, hey, I'm speaking about heaven. I, wanna, I wanna, want you guys to sing a song for me. And Rob kind of looked at me hesitantly like, oh, my gosh, he's going to ask me to sing another song. <laughs> And I said, you, I think you might know this song. I'm not sure. So it goes like this. My, I, I'm in my Rambler. I got the foot pedal to the metal. I want to know how Richard Petty feels. <laughs> said, I saved two months, bought a little diamond. Tonight is a night. It feels like perfect timing. Down on one knee. On mama's front steps. Man, I'm going to die if she says Yes. I want to know how forever feels. That's Kenny Chesney, in case you don't know. <laughs> Not that I'm a big country western fan, but I thought that lyric was interesting when he said, I want to know how forever feels. And I thought, yeah, I do too. I, I want to make sure my name is, is written in the Lamb's book of life. See, that, that's the question. Here, if, if you're in church today, which you are, some of you might not be, but maybe you are. We, we want to sign you up. Not in a gym, what kind of school, yeah. But it, as a travel agency, to make sure your, lamb's, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you might have the greatest trip of ever, the greatest travel experience of ever, in all eternity. And, and don't be a coward. Don't be fearful. Don't, 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 don't be unbelieving. You know, I had a guy once tell me, I was sharing the, 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 the Lord with him, and here's what he said. And I think a lot of people land in this situation sometimes. I was telling him about my testimony and how I came to the Lord and how that happens. And he said, yeah, but John, I couldn't do that. I go, why? He said, because I have a lot of doubts. And I'm not sure, you know, everything is, is true and real. And I said, well, you know what? Who doesn't? Could all of you out there who know Christ say, oh, I have no doubts ever whatsoever? I don't think so. We all have doubts. What was interesting to me was when I came to the Lord, I had all kinds of doubts. I didn't even know anything about the Bible. But one thing I wanted, and I said to the Lord this, Lord, 
I don't know if you're real or not. But I do know this. If you really love me, and you can really change me, and you can really help me, then I'm in. I'm in. And he did. He radically turned my life around from a high school dropout surfer who thought he knew everything to to a guy who finished high school and went off to Bible college and the seminary and still know nothing. (laughs) But I do know this, that Jesus loved me and died for me and changed me. And it's amazing what he does. And, and I know without a shadow of a doubt, as I read through this passage of Scripture, although I may not understand it and I'm not able to communicate it or describe it perfectly, I do know that when I get to the end of this chapter, I know for certain because of who he is and what he's done in my life and many others that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't care about the Medicare card unless i got to go to the doctor. I, I, I care about this that my name and hopefully your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that book's going to be opened one day. And you, you heard what it said. If your name wasn't found there, hopefully it will be. So I want to ask you a question. Because they're not going to ask you this question at the driver's license place. They're not going to ask you this question probably at the marriage, if you, if you go to the courthouse to get a marriage license. They're, they're not going to ask you this the, when you fill out for Medicare or passport or credit card. They're not going to ask you, well, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? They're not going to even mention it. But you know what? In a church, they will. When, when someone's teaching from the Bible, hopefully they'll ask you this question because you want to apply for this place where you can write your name or have your name written in this book. So I'll ask you the question based on Scripture. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? And do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? It, it, it's, it's, it's the most important question you could ever answer because the cowardly, those who are unwilling to make a stand, the unbelieving, those who come up with excuses why they can't, and the foul and the abominable, they will not enter in. So you have to ask, am I fearful? Am I unbelieving? Am I caught in a lifestyle that, that I know is wrong and I'm unwilling to leave it? Well, you can be forgiven, and you can find your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And it's an awesome thing to know that that thing is settled. Amen?